lifesavers and welcome back to my channel. My name is Nurse Kelly Tyrell and in today's video we are going to continue our neurological system series by talking about strokes. We're going to talk about the different types of strokes. We're also going to talk about etiology, signs and symptoms, diagnostic tests, treatments, and nursing interventions. But before we jump into it, make sure you subscribe to my channel, like, comment, and share this video with a friend, and make sure you click that bell icon to turn on notifications so you don't miss out on my upcoming content. If you confuse the different neuro disorders, symptoms, treatments, and interventions, then I suggest you keep watching. Patients who suffer from a stroke, whether it be an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, are losing brain cells by the second from the lack of oxygen and glucose, which is why it is so, so important that you as the nurse be able to spot and identify the early signs of stroke and know what nursing interventions and medications are needed. A stroke is also known as a cerebral vascular accident, or it can also be called a brain attack. A stroke results in some type of interruption in blood supply to the brain, similar to what happens to the heart during a heart attack. So when the blood supply is interrupted to this vital organ, the brain cells immediately start dying as a result. The patient starts to exhibit very noticeable neurological symptoms that we'll go into in just a few minutes. Interruption in blood supply to the brain can happen one of two ways. So the first way is through an obstruction or a blockage of the arterial blood flow, which is referred to as an ischemic stroke. So this type of stroke is typically caused by a blood clot or from a piece of plaque that has built up on the arterial wall and it has now broken off and traveled up to the brain. Blood or plaque clots can occur in patients who have comorbid or underlying health conditions such as atrial fibrillation, diabetes, heart disease, tobacco abuse, oral contraceptive use, or any other clotting disorder. The other way blood supply to the brain can be interrupted is by a leaking or a ruptured blood vessel, which is referred to as a hemorrhagic stroke. And these types of strokes are commonly seen in patients who have chronically high blood pressure because with high blood pressure over time, that pressure or force against the artery walls is going to start causing damage and will thin out those arteries over time, which can cause a small hole or it can cause a bulging in the artery, which is also known as an aneurysm. So when that aneurysm ruptures, patients will have a hemorrhagic stroke as a result. Patients can also experience a hemorrhagic stroke from some type of forceful trauma to the brain, usually from an accident where the head violently moves in a forward and backward pattern, causing shearing or tearing of the arteries in the brain. Prior to patients having a stroke, they may experience precursor warning signs, such as mini strokes called TIAs, or transient ischemic attacks. TIAs result from a temporary loss of blood flow to the brain, which causes some mild stroke-like symptoms, such as difficulty speaking and loss of balance or loss of consciousness. Now, the biggest difference between a TIA and a stroke is TIAs are temporary, and the symptoms will typically completely resolve within a few minutes to 24 hours. But these patients are at a significantly increased risk of having a major stroke within the very near future. And with stroke patients, you always want to remember that time means everything. So the quicker you implement nursing interventions, the better the chance of your patient's survival. Okay, now let's talk about some hallmark signs and symptoms that you will see with both types of strokes. So you'll want to be familiar with the acronym FAST to help you quickly identify some key symptoms. So F stands for facial drooping. This will be asymmetrical paralysis, which means it will be on one side of the face only. A is for arm weakness. So again, this will be asymmetrical, meaning that it will affect just one side. S stands for speech difficulty. So you want to look for muffled or slurred speech or aphasia, which means that the patient can't speak at all, or when they do, it just sounds like jumbled up words and it doesn't make any sense. But usually in the patient's mind, they know exactly what they're saying. It just doesn't sound like that when they're actually speaking. And T is for time. Like I said, timing is everything. There's a very high risk medication that you can give to patients having an ischemic stroke called TPA that we'll talk about in just a few minutes but it must be given within the first three hours after the onset of symptoms. So the longer the patient waits to receive treatment, 
the higher the chance of irreversible neurological deficits. So acute stroke patients are going to be at the very top of your priority list. And other signs and symptoms you will also want to be familiar with can include changes in mental impairment. So you can see things like disorientation, confusion, emotional changes such as combativeness, or having inappropriate laughing or crying episodes. For these personality changes, it's best to try and obtain a baseline mental status from the patient's immediate caregiver or loved one so you can compare their mental state from before to how they are acting now. Next are other sensory changes like visual or hearing changes. So these symptoms are especially common in patients who are having a stroke in the occipital part of the brain, which controls the vision, or the temporal lobe, which controls the hearing. And lastly are seizures or a severe headache, which is more common in hemorrhagic strokes because of that increased intracranial pressure from all of the bleeding in the brain. When you evaluate the severity of the patient's signs and symptoms, you're going to want to be familiar with a very common assessment tool called the NIH Stroke Scale. The NIH Stroke Scale measures patients from zero to two in the level of consciousness, vision, motor function of the arms and legs, sensory, language, and neglect. A normal patient without stroke symptoms will score a zero, and the max score a patient can get is 31. So the higher the score, the more severe the stroke symptoms are. Okay, so now let's talk about how we're going to actually diagnose these patients suspected of having a stroke. So there are a few different diagnostic tests you want to anticipate the doctor ordering. So first is going to be a CT scan, followed by an MRI and MRA. The CT scan will be able to identify any bleeding in the brain, but it's important to remember that these patients who are having an ischemic stroke may take a few hours for the area of ischemia to show up on a CAT scan. An MRI, however, will pick up the ischemia sooner, but the downside is the test takes much longer than a CT scan. An MRI will also be another test that takes longer than a CT scan, but it will show abnormal vessels or spasms or blockages of any arteries in the brain. The next test is a SPECT scan, which is a type of nuclear scan where they use dye to show how blood flows through tissues within the brain. So in the case of a stroke, it will show any areas that are not perfusing or moving the blood adequately. The next test is a carotid duplex ultrasound, which is going to look at the carotid arteries in the neck. This test is going to check for any plaque buildup or clots that may have broken off and traveled to the brain, which actually caused the stroke. And lastly is an echocardiogram or an EKG to check for clots in the heart that may have broken off and to check for any arrhythmia, uh, such as AFib, which is a quivering of that atria. So if the atria can't effectively push blood through the heart, the blood will sit and coagulate or clot in the heart and eventually will break off, travel to the brain and cause a stroke. Now let's move on to the treatment of these patients. So treatment is going to be pretty complex, but you first have to determine whether your patient had an ischemic stroke or did they have a hemorrhagic stroke because some of the treatments are going to be very different. If you give a thrombolytic medication like TPA to a patient who had a hemorrhagic stroke, you're only going to worsen the bleeding and the stroke, which can definitely have a very fatal outcome for the patient. So let's first start by talking about specific treatments for an ischemic stroke. So the gold standard number one medication that you're going to give is TPA if and only if the patient is within that three hour window from symptom onset. TPA is a clot busting medication, so it comes with a lot of risks and contraindications that you will definitely want to be familiar with. Contraindications to be giving TPA include any active bleeding in the brain, any head trauma within the last 90 days, prior history of intracranial bleeding, neoplasm, or arteriovenous malformation, also known as an AVM, or an aneurysm. Also major surgery in the last two weeks, recent use of heparin products with a high PT, PTT, and low platelet count, a lumbar puncture within the last week, an INR greater than 1.7, uncontrolled high blood pressure greater than 185 over 110, and having a terminal illness with a six month or less expectancy. And that's really just because you have to weigh the pros and cons of this very high risk medication and putting an already terminal patient through potential complications of TPA. 
So the next treatment specific to an ischemic stroke is to administer anticoagulants after TPA is given, which is usually going to be aspirin orally and heparin through the IV, and then the patient will be switched to Coumadin once their INR is at a therapeutic level between two and three. The next medication for ischemic strokes will be antiplatelet medication to decrease that stickiness of the platelets, which prevents future clots. The most common medication in the antiplatelet drug class is clopidogrel or Plavix. And the last treatment intervention that is specific to ischemic strokes is surgical interventions. The patient may have a carotid artery endarterectomy where the doctor actually removes any plaque buildup within the carotid artery, or they may have a stent placed in the carotid artery if there's any kind of narrowing or impaired blood flow. Okay, let's talk about specific treatments for hemorrhagic strokes. So the first treatment is to determine the cause of the bleeding, and you want to start at the source. So for example, is the bleeding from a ruptured aneurysm, from trauma, from an arteriovenous malformation? Knowing the cause will help you to prioritize which interventions will come next. The next treatment is to stop any and all blood thinning medications, including aspirin, Coumadin, Plavix, Lovenox, heparin, and you'll also want to administer vitamin K if the patient has been treated with Coumadin immediately prior to the stroke. Vitamin K is the antidote for Coumadin, so it's going to reverse the effects and hopefully slow down the bleeding in the brain. The next treatment is to anticipate giving a platelet transfusion. So platelets are our body's natural clotting factors. So by giving additional donor platelets, the hope is that the platelets will travel to the area of the bleeding and help to plug the hole where the bleeding is occurring in the brain. The next treatment will be to control the high blood pressure through rapid acting IV antihypertensive medications like labetalol, hydralazine, esmolol, nicarpidine, enalapril, nitroglycerin, and nitropuricide. And the last treatment options specific to hemorrhagic strokes are different surgical options. So surgery will really be dependent upon what originally caused the hemorrhage. The physician can do an aneurysm clipping if an aneurysm was the cause. If the bleeding is from an AVM or arteriovenous malformation, then they can do an embolization or a burning of the defect with a laser at the site of the bleeding. And the last surgical procedure the patient may need is a cranial decompression surgery where the doctor drills little burr holes in the skull to alleviate the pressure being placed on the brain from the bleeding. Okay, now let's talk about treatments that are in common for both types of strokes. So the first treatment is to administer corticosteroids to decrease the swelling in the brain. And the most common IV corticosteroid that you're going to use is dexamethasone or decadron. The next treatment in common is starting therapy as soon as the patient is medically stable enough to do so. So these patients are going to need several weeks of rehabilitation therapy, including speech therapy for speech and swallowing, physical therapy to maintain muscle tone and rebuild strength, and occupational therapy to help regain function with activities of daily living. The last common treatment for both types of stroke will be to maintain proper nutrition and hydration. Remember, these patients are going to have difficulty with speech and swallowing, so they'll likely need modifications in their diet to puree foods and thicken liquids, or they may need TPN therapy and IV fluids if they're too high risk for aspiration and choking. As far as nursing interventions go, your care is going to be centered around monitoring vital signs, neurovascular checks, and safety. So you will also want to make sure that you're familiar with using the Glasgow Coma Scale to assess for signs of deterioration in neurological status. The Glasgow Coma Scale assesses for eye opening, motor responses, and verbal responses. It's scored using a numeric scale, and the highest number a patient can get is 15, which means that they are completely alert, oriented, and able to follow commands. So the higher the score with this scale, the more stable they are, unlike the NIH jerk scale. You will also wanna make sure that you are familiar with recognizing the signs of increased intracranial pressure, because both types of stroke patients are going to be at a really high risk for developing ICP. The most common signs of ICP are going to be a diminished level of consciousness, headaches, restlessness, confusion, nausea and vomiting, also speech changes and seizures. 
So if you see any of these symptoms, then you wanna make sure that you notify the provider right away and you don't delay any kind of nursing interventions and care. Hopefully now you are a pro at identifying the differences between ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes and you know how to treat and care for these patients. And if you want a sneak peek into my future lectures, make sure you tune in with me live every Wednesday at 9 p.m. for a study with me. I go live on all of my social channels, including right here on YouTube. So I'll have all of the information linked in the description box below. And then at the end of the study with me live, I also have an open Q&A where you can ask me anything. So I hope that you'll join me next week. Come prepared to learn something and make sure you have a pen and paper to take notes because I will also have an interactive pop quiz. So I'll see you there, lifesavers. And that concludes the end of this lesson. I hope that you found this information extremely valuable and it made you just a little more confident as you prepare to take your NCLEX or your next nursing school exam. I just wanna thank you all again so much Lifesavers for tuning in today. My name is Nurse Kelly Tyrell and I help nurses feel more confident, increase their test scores and retain what they don't remember in nursing school. Speaking of, are you a nursing student or soon to be or ready to take your NCLEX? If so, have you joined my online student community yet? If not, then what are you waiting for? The university community is a complete nursing resource hub all at your fingertips. Inside, you can expect to receive coaching, community, and content. You'll get daily coaching with your mobile mentor, me, Nurse Kelly Tyrell. You'll also receive access to weekly educational videos that you can watch monthly before they even publish to YouTube. You'll also get exclusive printable digital downloads like worksheets, quizzes, flashcards, infographics, cheat sheets, skills checklists, and more. And if this video helped you in any way, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to smash that subscribe button and click that notification bell so you don't miss out on my upcoming content. Also, if you can do me a favor and drop me a comment below, let me know where you're at with your nursing journey. I'd love to just say hi and connect with you. Also, make sure you click that share icon to spread the word and encourage a fellow aspiring nurse. And last but not least, when you are ready to take your NCLEX, be sure to check out my NCLEX and Show review, where I review detailed test taking strategies and cover every major topic that you can expect to find on the NCLEX. If you want to have that unfair advantage and pass your NCLEX on your very next attempt, be sure to click the link in the description box below. Not ready to end the study sesh yet? Well, you are in luck because if you stick around, you can watch more of my videos coming at you in three, two, one. Bye, Lifesavers.